NBC Sports presents Game 3 of the 1970 World Series. The National League champions, the Cincinnati Reds, versus the American League champions, the Baltimore Orioles. It's 68 degrees in Baltimore, Maryland. Extremely overcast this morning with a threat of rain, but the sun has burned off the overcast and fog. It's going to be very humid here, though, but it's a good day for baseball as the World Series now has shifted sight. Hi, everybody. I'm Kurt Gowdy of NBC Sports. Chuck Thompson, the voice of the Baltimore Orioles, roaming the stands again will be Tony Kubek of NBC. And the Reds are up against it. They've now been made 5-1 to one underdog. No team has ever lost the first two games of the series in their home ballpark and gone on to win. But the Reds were a loose outfit working out here yesterday. They know that they have an uphill climb, but they still feel they can do it. They have one thing going for them, the law of averages. Hidden behind the fanfare of the World Series glare is that magnificent winning streak of Baltimore. They've won 16 games in succession. Their last 11 regular season games, three playoff games against Minnesota, and now two World Series games. And you all know that winning streaks have to come to an end at some time. 16 in a row, so maybe the law of averages will be working against the Baltimore Orioles. Now let's take a look at today's starting pitchers. And on your right, for the visitors, 30-year-old Tony Cloninger, who three years ago was fighting blindness. He had a mysterious eye ailment. Now his vision's back to normal 2020. He won nine games this year. Not a lot, but eight of the wins were after July, and he pitched very well the last two months of the season. On your left is Dave McNally, whose 24 victories tied him with Mike Cuellar and Gaylord Perry as the high victories of the Major League pitching season. McNally for Baltimore, Cloninger for Cincinnati. Let's get over now and have the outstanding voice for 11 years of the Baltimore Orioles, Chuck Thompson, take you around his home ballpark. Chuck? Thank you very much, Kurt. Well, we come from that beautiful uh, Riverfront Stadium in Cincinnati where every bounce was absolutely true, back to Mother Nature and grass. And there are some oddities in this ballpark in Baltimore that we would like to explain to you. Looking down the left field line into the corner, you will see a yellow stripe to the left of the foul line. Anything on the left side of that is just out of play. Now, that concrete wall, 309 feet away, is 14 feet high. Now, there is another oddity in this ballpark. As we look along the left field wall, you will see a great big yellow stripe. Any ball that hits on that stripe or to the right of it is a home run. Anything the other side is in play. And if you've read some of the stories about Baltimore's Memorial Stadium and daylight baseball, there is a problem with the background. When the sun shines, these white houses out on 33rd Street behind the stadium give the right-handed hitters a problem, particularly if they have a right-handed pitcher such as Jim Palmer going. It is still possible for the hitter to have trouble seeing the ball when thrown by some left-handers. So those are the physical dimensions of our ballpark in Baltimore, 309 feet down the lines, 410 feet straight away to center field to a seven-foot wall. That's the story physically on the playing surface here in Baltimore. And now let's go downstairs to Tony Kubek. With me, Sandy Koufax, one of the fine left-handers of all time. And Sandy, Cincinnati not in a desirable position right now, being two down. But what has surprised you as far as the first two ball games about the Cincinnati club? Well, I think so far there, there haven't been that many surprises. Uh, both clubs have shown they can score some runs. Cincinnati's had pitching trouble most of the year, and they've continued to have it here. But the biggest surprise, uh, as far as I'm concerned, is nobody's tried out uh, the catcher Hendricks for Baltimore. Uh, the first game, they stole two bases. He couldn't throw. He's coming off a broken finger. Nobody's, nobody's checked it out. They've sort of ignored it. And uh, I think that's a big factor. If you can take the extra base or steal a little bit, it goes a long way to getting those extra runs. And that's unusual with, of course, Tolan and Pete Rose and some of the other speedsters in that Cincy lineup. All right, you're Tony Cloninger today. Boog Powell's got the hot bat. What do you do? Well, I think you've got to pitch around Boog. If I'm a right-hand pitcher, uh, I've got to do my best to not let Boog hurt me. Uh, Brooks, Frank, you know, both Robinsons are great hitters, but uh, if you're a right-hander, I think Boog is the big man in the Baltimore lineup. I think he's the big man in the Baltimore attack probably against anybody, but I'm, I'm not going to give Boog Powell a chance to hurt me. Sandy Koufax, thank you so much. Let's go back upstairs. Go 
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Baltimore's Memorial Stadium for the third game of the 1970 World Series. Here are the official lineups. First, the Cincinnati Reds. Here is the manager of the Cincinnati Reds, number 10, Sparky Anderson. Batting first and playing right field, number 14, Pete Rose. Batting second and playing center field, number 28, Bobby Tolan. Batting third and playing third base, number 24, Tony Perez. Batting fourth, catching for Cincinnati, number five, Johnny Bench. Batting fifth, playing first base, number 23, Lee May. Batting six, playing left field, number 11, Hal McRae. Batting seventh, playing second base, number 19, Tommy Helms. Batting eight, playing shortstop, number 13, Dave Concepcion. Batting ninth, and pitching for the Reds, number 40, Tony Cloninger in the bullpen. And here are the remaining players and coaches of the Cincinnati Reds. Alex Branis, Ted Lozuski, George Sugar, Larry Shepard, Mel Baney, Angel Bravo, Bernie Carbo, Clay Carroll, Darrell Cheney, Ty Klein, Pat Corrales, Wayne Granger, Don Gullett, Jim McLaughlin, Jim Merritt, Gary Nolan, Wayne Stewart, Ray Washburn, Milt Wilcox, Woody Woodward, the National League champion, Cincinnati Reds. for the American League champion, the Baltimore Orioles. Here is the manager of the Baltimore Orioles, number four, Earl Weaver. <laughs> Batting first, playing left field, number nine, Don Buford. Batting second, playing shortstop, number seven, Mark Belanger. Batting third, playing first base, number 26, Boog Powell. Batting fourth, playing right field, number 20, Frank Robinson. Batting fifth, playing center field, number six, Paul Blair. Batting six, playing third base, number five, Brooks Ramakin. Batting seventh, playing second base, number 15, Dave Johnson. Batting eighth, catching for Baltimore, number eight, Andy Etcheverin. Batting ninth. And pitching for the Orioles this afternoon, number 19, Dave McNally on the sideline. And here are the remaining players and coaches of the Baltimore Orioles. George Bamberger, Jim Fry, Billy Hunter, George Stoller, Terry Crowley, Mike Boyar, Mo Drabowski, Bobby Rich, Dick Paul, Jim Harden, Elrod Hendricks, Dave Leonard, Marcelino Lopez, Kurt Moten, Jim Palmer, Tom Phoebus, Merv Redman, Pete Rickert, Chico Salmon, 
Eddie Watt, the American League champion, Baltimore Orioles. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for our national anthem, which will be played by the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra and will be sung by Joseph Eubanks, professor of music at the Morgan State College. and the flag flying from the main flagpole here at the stadium today is a replica of the giant star-spangled banner, 30 by 42 feet in size, which was made by Mary Pickersgill in the Flag House of Baltimore and which inspired Francis Scott Key to write the national anthem when he saw it still flying in the dawn's early light September 14 of 1814. This third game of the 1970 World Series is being brought to you from Baltimore as the Cincinnati Reds meet the Baltimore Orioles. Well, the first ball will be thrown out today by Lefty Grove, 70 years old. And he was born in the state of Maryland, Atlanta Coning, Maryland. We understand he now makes his home in Norwalk, Ohio, lives with his son. One of the true greats of baseball. He won 300 games, led the American League in strikeouts in each of his first seven years in the league. And he joined Baltimore of the International League 50 years ago in August of 1920. Lefty Grove throwing out the first ball to Andy Echebarren. As Kurt has mentioned, the weather in Baltimore was quite threatening, ominous and overcast this morning. It has turned into a very beautiful afternoon. Uh, the sun is uh, breaking through more and more as uh, we progress through the afternoon, and it looks as though we will have an ideal October afternoon for baseball and game number three. I doubt that there could be a baseball fan in the country who is not well aware of what problems face the Cincinnati Reds today. However, if they are good baseball fans, then they know that the Reds are equal to that task. Defensively, uh, uh, we'll take a look at the Baltimore Orioles at first base, Boog Powell. The second baseman is Dave Johnson. The shortstop is Mark Belanger. And you've heard of this man, number five, Brooks Robinson, the Oriole third baseman. The left fielder, again, is Don Buford. The center fielder, Paul Blair. And the right fielder, Frank Robinson. The catcher, making his first start in the 70s series, is Andy Echebarren. And on the mound is the 24-game winning left-hander, Dave McNally. And, of course, the Cincinnati legend against left-handers bears repeating, and we will repeat it for you from time to time throughout the course of the afternoon. Tony Benson is the umpire at the plate, Bob Stewart at first, Bill Williams at second, Emmett Ashford at third. On the right field line, John Flaherty. On the left field line, Ken Burkhart. And it is with a great deal of pleasure now we turn the microphone back to the voice of NBC, Kurt Gowdy. Thank you, Chuck. Pete Rose will be leading off. 
He'll be followed by Bobby Tolan and Tony Perez. Yes, the Reds are murderous against left-handed pitching. This is no ordinary left-hander they're facing today, though. Ladies and gentlemen, here's an announcement. Here's that we'll move responsible for the gray sheets. They're asking the fans hanging over the wall out in the left field the area. They're side. hanging sheets or banners out there to remove the banners. They're being taken off now. Just a slight breeze blowing out. Pete Rose has gone hitless and six times up. He's had only one ball out of the infield in the first two games. Ground ball, base hit. So he's got his first hit. We're about to say that Pete Rose is not discouraged easily at any time. He's on. And Bobby Tolan, who's had two hits in eight times, has had a homer and an RBI, will be the batter. Tolan has a big fan over in the Baltimore dugout, Earl Weaver, the Baltimore manager. Weaver says, boy, I like that kid's swing. He's got a great swing. And how old is he, 29 or 30? Somebody said 24. He's only 24, but he's going to be something. Tolan hit 316 for the season. Play him as a pull hitter to right. The Reds jumped quickly in the first two games, had leads of 3 0, 4 0. Let's see what they do today. It dumps the bunt, and it is a fair ball. It started down the dirt. Usually they'll trickle to the foul line. That one got some spin on and went to the grass. We can take a look at this perfectly placed bunt, and you, as you watch it, you wonder what might have happened had it been bunted this way at the Riverfront Stadium in Cincinnati. But it was uh, just the perfect bunt. Brooks Robinson made the only play possible. He would not have had a chance of getting Tolan and hoped it would roll foul. It did not. Tony Perez is up. One hit in seven times in the series. Hit 317 for the year with 40 homers. Ball one to him. Perez, Bench, May, real power in the middle of that Cincinnati lineup. We anglicize his name. That's the way they call it in Cincinnati, his hometown, uh, and most of the announcers, Perez. Perez is the Spanish pronunciation. So we get some wires and letters. Why don't we say Perez? We'll say Perez. And he, uh, we talked to him about it, and he said, that's the way everybody calls it anyway. Go ahead. Two balls, no strikes to him. Bounty ball to Robinson. That's one and two. The pitcher's best friend, the double play. Brooks Robinson, the Reds say they should bar him. He's illegal. He's been the difference in the series, I think, Chuck. Uh, I think it's quite obvious, and among other things, he has been called uh, illegal. Uh, they refer to him as the human vacuum cleaner. Two down, Bobby Tolan a second, Johnny Bench up. Two hits and seven times, a home run. A slow one is a ball doing. Bench led the majors in homers with 45 and had the sixth highest RBI total in National League history with 148. Just 22 years old. On deck, Lee May. First inning to score. Cincinnati nothing. Reds defensively had Lee May at first base. Tommy Helms at second. Their one change today defensively is Dave Concepcion at shortstop instead of Woody Woodward. Tony Perez at third. Hal McCray will be playing left field. Bobby Tolan in center. Pete Rose, the right fielder. Johnny Bench catching, and 30-year-old Tony Lee Cloninger on the mound. His 13th pro season began in the Milwaukee Brave organization back in 1958. Reportedly received a $100,000 bonus. 
The Giants tried to get him, and when he signed with the Braves, they went 100 miles away and signed another great young pitcher in North Carolina by the name of Gaylord Perry. They were both scheduled to meet in the state high school finals that year, but they didn't get there. Perry did. Don Buford, a switch hitter leading off. Ball one. There's Buford, who has three hits and eight times in a series. No homers or RBIs. But the Reds failed to score in the first inning for the first time in the series. Moniger, ball two. Moniger does not have, as you look at his figures, nine wins, seven losses, a big record. But he pitched very well in July, August, and September. He was a reliever starter, and they started him after July when Wayne Simpson came up with a sore arm. Ball three. He was stricken with a mysterious eye ailment in 1967. A reaction from steroids, and uh, he was nearly blind in one eye. His vision's all right now. A 3-0 pitch. He walked him on four pitches. He's had control problems this season, as well as in previous years. He averaged nearly five walks a game every five nine innings seconds. he pitched this year. That's a lot of walks. Back in 65, he tied for the lead in most walks. He led the National League in walking the most batters in 66. So he's always struggled with his control. Mark Belanger is hitting number two today with Andy Etcheberrin catching. Langers had one hit in seven times. Perez looking for the bun in third. Right in there, a fastball for a strike. No score, last of the first inning. They play Belanger in the outfield to the opposite field. Buford at first. Excellent base runner. Games authorized under TV rights granted by Major League Baseball solely for the entertainment of our audience. Any publication, reproduction, retransmission, or the use of the pictures without the express written consent of the Commissioner of Baseball is prohibited. The count is one strike to Belanger. Fly ball in the right field. Pete Rose is playing shallow and toward the line. Easy catch for him. He grabs everything one-handed out there. Booze. You'll hear the booze. Sounds like booze, but it's just a uh, love the Baltimore fans have for this big fella. Kurt uh, Powell has been quoted as saying, have no fear. When they miss that G, I know it. <laughs> Powell. Has been a damaging hitter in the playoffs all year long and continuing right into the World Series. Three hits in six times. He's hit a home run in each World Series game thus far. He and Lee May are tied for the most runs batted in four. That's where they're trying to pitch him. They're trying to jam him inside. They have fallen behind on the count on him. Right on the fist. The book foul. 
Well, Buford's on first. Frank Robinson is looking for his first hit. Got four hits to nine Marky Anderson watching the action. I'll tell you that Anderson, the gracious man, he has praised everyone. We lost audio, I understand, for a couple of minutes. We apologize. The audio is back. Buford at first. Fans got a break when they lost the audio. <laughs> Ball one to Frank Robinson. No score. Last of the first inning. Keep her eye on Buford with two down. They may start him. Foul back. Take a look out in center field. And tuck this in the back of your mind. See how deep Bobby Tolan plays against the power batter. Now when one of the power hitters is up for the Reds, we'll take a look at Paul Blair and show you how shallow he plays. Blair plays shallow because he said he doesn't come on to a ball as well as he does going back. One ball, one strike. Two outs, Buford at first. Throw. Buford twice finished as American League runner-up in steals. He doesn't run as much now as he used to when he was with the White Sox. There he goes. Hit and run. Buford's on the way to third. Now a classic example of the hit and run. Buford at third. Frank Robinson at first, coming up with his first World Series hit of 1970. And Paul Blair, the batter. Blair is hitting 333 in the World Series. Three out of nine, one RBI. It's 267 for the season. A bench of you want to get together. Paul Blair is one of four players in World Series history to hit a home run to win a game by a one nothing score. He did it against the uh, Dodgers in 66. Casey Stendhal, Tommy Hendrick, Frank Robinson are the other three. Two out runners in first and third, no score. Fastball is high. Cloninger's throwing hard. The scout report on him an average fastball most of the year. Later in the season, his fastball to hit a home run to win a game by a one nothing score. He did it against the uh, Dodgers in 66. Casey Stengel, Tommy Henry, Frank Robinson are the other three. Two out runners in first and third, no score. Fastball is high. Cloninger's throwing hard. The scout report on him, an average fastball most of the year. Later in the season, his fastball became better. One ball, no strikes. Ooh, one and one. He was acquired by the Reds in June of 68 with Clay Carroll and Woody Woodward in a trade with the Braves for Milt Pappas Ted Davidson and Bob Johnson. One ball, one strike to Paul Blair. Earl Weaver. Playing Blair almost straight away. Two and one to him. Brooks Robinson's on deck. He may not get up this inning. When he does get up, Chuck, I bet he'll get an ovation here. Uh, that not just for his performance in the World Series either, Kurt. He's been the most popular Oriole ever to wear the uniform. And what a favor uh, Paul Richards did baseball when he decided that this man would not make it as the second baseman. You better try third. Right. Didn't cover enough ground for Richards at second. Too slow, he said. 
He's right. Two one pitch. Three and one throw down. You haven't had much of a chance in this series because the Orioles have not been running. To watch Johnny Bench throw. The young catcher is one of the greatest throwing arms in the history of the game. And with men on base, he's not afraid to throw that ball around either. He shows them that arm, and they're, they're leery. He gets rid of uh, the ball in a hurry with something on it. Putting all his skills together, hitting, receiving, agility behind the plate and throwing. There, uh, the bluff at first, foul back. Frank Robinson bluffed the dash to second. Three and two, a two down. Robinson will be going on this pitch at first. Buford's at third. So far, Cloninger has been relying on his fastball. There goes Robinson. Foul back. Cloninger is not a strikeout pitcher. He's averaged a little over three strikeouts every nine innings he's pitched this year. Good size, six feet, 215. Born in Lincoln County, North Carolina. Lives now in Denver, North Carolina. The 3 2 delivery with a runner going. Ball four, the bases are loaded. And that's two walks already. Brooks Robinson, listen to the hand for him. Brooks Robinson. I don't know how a player can be as big a star as he is and so nice. That's what's really marvelous about Robinson is his personality off the field and his character. Well, the Orioles have the bases loaded, two down. Last of the first inning, there's no score. The strike a letter high fastball. Now we're getting some warm-up action. Wayne Granger. Uh, the Granger, Rangers. right. To Brooks Robinson. He had two hits and eight times in the series. One and one. Cloninger struggling with his control. On deck is Davy Johnson. Brooks achieved a number of milestones in 1970. It's Buford at third, Frank Robinson at second, Paul Blair at first. Came up with his 2,000th hit this year and his 1,000th RBI, both against Washington's Joe Coleman. Center, dropping in. One run is in. Robinson scoring. In the second goes Brooks Robinson, and the Orioles lead two to nothing. Robinson not only makes clutch plays in the field, but he gets many big hits for the Orioles. So he now has tied Boog Powell and Lee May for the most RBIs in this series. He has four. Two outs, runners on second and third. The Orioles going for that juggler vein of the Reds, leading 2 nothing. Ball one. Marky Anderson, mm. he's in trouble now, and he knows it. Davy Johnson has had two hits in six times. A straightaway for him. A high fly to left center. Bobby Tolan coming on. And that's it for the Orioles in the first. They sent seven men to the plate. They had two runs. Two hits, there were no errors. They left two at the end of the Zuski, the all-time 
top first baseman of the Reds, coaching at first. Oddly enough, had a great World Series for the White Sox in 59, hitting three homers in that series. And Alex Grammas, a former National League infielder, coaching at third. Lee May starts it off. Foul ball. May has had three hits in eight times, four RBIs, and he's hit the ball sharply down the third twice. They've been gobbled up by Brooks Robinson. May, McCray, and Helms is the lineup here for the Reds in the second. Ball. As you watch Dave McNally, especially for former Whitey Ford fans, he reminds you a lot of Whitey Ford the way he works. Sneaky fastball, good curve, moves the ball around. Right two, one and two. One great big difference between uh, McNally and Whitey Ford, however, Whitey Ford had the great move to first base, one of the very best. And believe it or not, Dave McNally does not have a good move to first. One, two pitch. First strike out by McNally. McNally is almost as sure as you're going to get an income tax bill. He's had three consecutive 20 win seasons 22 wins in 68. 20 wins in 69 and 24 wins this year. He's the only American League pitcher who's won at least 20 in each of the last three years. Hal McRae, two for four on Sunday, strike to him. Dave McNally will be 29 years old on October 31st. deck is Tommy Helm. McNally was born in the Big Sky country, Billings, Montana. The only Montana boy. It's two and one. And uh, even here, this last inning, the top of the first, the bottom of the first inning, he came up with the. This fella had the greatest blue ribbon crowd screams in the world out there, and never fished as a youngster. Still does. A two-one pitch. A little looper. Going out is Belanger. The Texas League hit in the center by McRae. And now Tommy Helms comes up. Helms has had one hit in eight times in the series. Looking in today, Tommy Richardson, the president of the Eastern League. Tommy Helms. Tommy's a little bit under par. Out here, this is the first time he's missed a World Series in 40 years. We send our best to Tommy Richardson, the president of the Eastern League. McCray back to first. Baltimore jumped out to a 2-0 lead in the top of the second. Foul ball over in the Oriole dugout. They don't have the wire fence in front of the dugouts here, as they do in Cincinnati, to protect the players and foul balls. hits in the first and Perez hit into a double play. Bench lined out. Here in the second they have McCray at first, one down. One ball, two strikes. Andy Etcheberrin, you know the old saying in baseball, don't change horses in the middle of the stream when you're winning. Or Weaver has changed his lineup. Ellie Hendricks caught the first two games, but he switched to Etcheberrin because Etcheberrin and McNally have been battery mates for years. Etcheberrin caught McNally's first game in the majors, and he used to catch him in the minors, right, Chuck? Right. One ball, two strikes. Hit slowly to third. Brooks Robinson up, fires. We'll be able to look at this play again, Kurt, and uh, the thing to notice is the tremendously quick release of the ball by Brooks. All in one fluid motion and a very accurate arm. Now we can take a look at it again. Uh, 
and watch the Robinson move as he approaches. This is the same ground out by Helms. And watch again that quick, fluid release. All in one motion. And he throws strikes to first base and has a great target to throw at him, the big man, Boog Powell. Dave Concepcion's up. Fouls it back. He hasn't had a time at bat in the series. He lives in Venezuela. He's improved his average each time he's moved up. This year, he hit 260. Last year at Indianapolis, he was a 340 hitter. He's young. 22, and he's got a base hit to right field. Here's going to be a play at the plate. Robinson throws. take a look at the uh, first Cincinnati run on the base hit Frank has and the throw is right on the money and as will happen now and then in the game of the baseball a perfect throw went right through Echebar and the Reds are in now let's watch this runner coming from second base and uh, McRae is really flying one of the very fine runners in the red team Here's the approach, and that ball took kind of a flat hop, didn't it, as it went by Echebarren, and there's the tag of the plate for the run. You're right, Chuck. That ball didn't come up to him the way he expected. It took that, that low hop. An error's been charged on Echebarren. Ball one. With two down, they sent McCray. Ball was hit hard to right. The throw was there. So Echebarren is charged with an error. It's a single for Concepcion. He went to second on the throw to the plate. Cloninger's a good hitter for a pitcher. Well, he's done something that's almost unbelievable. That's Pete Rose on deck. Back in July of 1966, he's playing and pitching for the Braves of San Francisco. And he hit two grand slammers in one game. Tied a major league record. And a record for a pitcher. Nine runs batted in in one game. One ball, two strikes. Two grand slammers in one game. That'd make a good season for a lot of people. Two to one now. Orioles ahead. Fouls it out of play. Trying to go to right with a breaking pitch. Now the Reds have out hit the Orioles. Four hits to two. But they're trailing two to one. Two strikes to count. Two strikeouts that inning for McNally. One run for the Reds. Two hits. There was one error. One man left. George Stoller, who spent most of his playing career in the minors, coaching at first for the Orioles. And Billy Hunter, one of the original Orioles when the Orioles moved here. in St. Louis coaching the third. A former infielder. up now. And he hit 243 for the team. His first time up in this 70 World Series. Boninger's delivery. Bounty ball to third. Perez cuts it off. One away. Perez, a very talented player, a big, good-natured Cuban fellow. Played under Earl Weaver in winter baseball, and Weaver was needling me today, yelling at him. I'm going to send Brooks out and show you how to play the position. Perez says, you're right. I can take lessons from him anywhere. So. Dave McNally gets a hand as he comes up. He's not a bad hitter. He's hit five lifetime homers in his American career. Right in there for a strike. He had a home run in the World Series, too, against the Mets at Shea Stadium off Jerry Kuzman. Wide breaking pitch, nothing in two. One of the few curves that Cloninger has thrown so far. Just a little low. One ball, two strikes. Buford on deck at the top of the order. He's gone. 
First strikeout for Cloninger. Don Buford up, walked his first time, scored the first run of the game. Base is empty. You never know about records in the minor league. Scouts look for arms and the bats and the speed. Ball one. Cloninger in 59 had no wins and nine losses. An earned run average of 9.59. That's nine runs a game in the three I league. Two years later, he's pitching in the major leagues and a winning pitcher with Milwaukee. One and one to Buford. Let up. Ball two, two and one. Cloninger's best year was 65. He won 24 and lost 11 for the Milwaukee Braves. Best winning season since then was in 1966 when he won 14 and lost 11. High fly, deep to right. Pete Rose out there drawing a beat on it. And the Orioles are down 1-2-3 in the second inning. Well, we've gone two innings and the score. The Reds have the top of the order up. Rose, Tolan, and Perez in the third inning. Two runs, two hits, one error for the Orioles. One run, four hits, no errors for the Reds. Strike to Rose, who singled the center his first time. Rose led the Reds this year in singles, doubles, and triples. Speed pitch, one and one. A hometown boy, Pete Rose. Watched the Reds for years. The youngster hanging around the ballpark. Always had the dream to play with him. In a World Series, the dream came true. Two and one. McNally today. They're stinging him. Bobby Tolan beat out of Bunny's first time. One and oh to him. The Reds have a good infield, too. You don't win a pennant without a good infield. But this Oriole infield has been superb the last two or three years. We explain the first day they have an award at the end of every year. The Sporting News conducts it. They give the Golden Glove, a gold glove for the best defensive players. And last year, 69, Baltimore had three gold glove winners in the infield. Foul ball. Johnson, Belanger, and Brooks Robinson in the infield, and Blair in center field. One and two. Leading two to one in the third. Foul back. Left-handers usually don't bother Bobby Tolan. Has a better average against left-handed pitching than he does right-handed. He's 335 against lefties this year, 309 against right-handers. Just missed. Two and two to Tolan. They 
Dave Johnson to his left. Two down. Tony Perez coming up. Hit into a double play. Number 24. His first time Johnny down to third base Robinson. Slow ball outside, one and nothing. We're in the third inning, game three. Baltimore's ahead, two to one. Perez likes that ball out over the plate. Two and one to him. If you get it there, you're in trouble. Nobody on. Johnny Bench on deck. First walk given up by Dave McNally. Bench lined to third. The Reds have had Number four five. hits Johnny and two line drives that have been caught. Johnny, an Oklahoma boy, an eighth Indian descent. No errors, one left. At the end of two and a half innings, every sports fan can share in America's Olympic effort. Here's how. Send a $5 check today to Olympic House, Box CB, 57 Park Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. In return, you'll receive a colorful embroidered cloth pack commemorating the 72 Olympic Winter Games to be held in Sapporo, Japan. As an Olympic contributor, you'll wear it proudly. And NBC, by the way, will cover the Winter Olympics in 72. Mark Belanger lost the foul to the first baseman, Lee Maynard, one down. You note the players have the sunglasses on today. Good foul, fouled out his first time. How he wanted the World Series to end in four days. He said, Yeah, I want to get down to Miami fishing. <laughs> Strike to him. Powell was selected most valuable player in the Orioles by the best radio TV personnel the last two years. One out, nobody on. Two to one, Baltimore. Last of the third. They have the shift on against him. Concepcion beats him with a shift. He was over there on the right side a second. Piles out from the shortstop to the first baseman. Frank Robinson up single to right. Take a look at Cloninger. They say that he could perspire in Alaska in the middle of the winter. He's already drenched with press radio tea breeze personnel the last two years. One out, nobody on. Two to one, Baltimore. Last to the third. They have a shift on against him. Concepcion beats him with a shift. He was over there on the right side a second. Piles out from the shortstop to the first baseman. Frank Robinson up single to right. Take a look at Cloninger. They say that he could perspire in Alaska in the middle of the winter. He's already drenched with perspiration C shirt. And he changes uh, his shirt a couple times a game. 
This is a human day here, too. Breaking pitch away from Robinson, the ball. This is Frank Robinson with the baby on her lap. There's a long belt to deep center going. And that one is gone. That's Frank's fifth World Series home run. He's not hit for too high an average in the series, but he's hit with power. Take a look at the power generated in the Frank Robinson swing, and he got just about all of this one, just about all, straight away to center field, and as Kurt called it, never in doubt, never. Paul Blair fouls it back, three to one Baltimore, last of the third. That ball cleared the 410 mark. I imagine a 400 and 20, 30 foot home run out there. Maybe 430. About 430. One and one. Powell hit one farther in Cincinnati. Straight away center. Powell back toward the netting. Johnny Bench. Can't get it. Oh, and Frank swung that bat. That baby disappeared from Mrs. Robbins' lap in a hurry, didn't it? <laughs> really <laughs> did. Bobby, an enthusiastic Oriole fan, a very lovely young lady, and uh, it's one of many great moments that she has shared with her husband. What a career he's had. You see, she didn't lose the baby, Kurt. No. Three to one, Baltimore. Two down, nobody on, last of the third. Ryan shot the left. McCray is back in with it. The Blair's on first. And Brooks Robinson up. Robinson doubled in two runs in the first. This is a hot baseball team. 16 wins in a row. They're doing everything right. The Reds hope to cool them off today. Kurt, there's a little story. You mentioned uh, Brooks when I highlights his 2000th base hit. It happened to be a home run that won an Oriole ball game, and the fans brought the ball back in and gave it to him. He had a cake in his lap going home that night and held it up to show some of the ball players and lost the ball, but found it the next day in the yard. Blair at first. He stole 24 bases this season. Left the club in stolen bases. Ranger in the bullpen. A ball. Two down. Each team has four hits. There we go. Bench just throw right on the money. Uh, look at that kid throw. Perfect throw by Johnny Ben to get the speedy Blair. Let's take a look at this thing again. Looking now in from center field, here's the good break by Blair, and he had a good jump. And it looked as though Bench almost juggled the ball momentarily, but look at the end result. No doubt about it. What a great throw. One run, two hits, no errors, nobody left. May fouls the first pitch off. May struck out his first time. Three for nine now in this World Series. Three runs, four hits for the Orioles. One run, four hits for the Reds. The Orioles have made the only error. The curve misses, one ball, one strike. Nally had a strong finish. Ground ball to Robinson at third. One down. The Reds have been hitting the ball where they don't want to, down to Robinson. 
Now McRae singled. And a score of the Cincinnati run. He broke a leg a couple of years ago. Set him back. Foul back. He's born in Avon Park, Florida. Lives down in Bradenton. 24 years old. Slid in the home in the Puerto Rican Winter League. After having a fine year in 68 and broke his leg. There's a drive foul down the left field line. No balls and two strikes to Hal McRae. McNally won his 12 of his last 14 decisions. He went nine days ago and beat the Twins in the playoffs. Cuellar, McNally, and Palmer like to work a lot, don't they, Chuck? They like to work every third or fourth day. Every fourth day, and that's the reason for the delay on the screen right now. Somebody going out to the Reds' bullpen. McNally, as you uh, know, pitched eight innings in an intra-squad game. They can't get the gate open. He can't quite to find the combination. Even his teammates won't tell him. Now they got it. <laughs> One out, nobody on. Two strikes to Hal McRae. One and two. The big three of the Orioles started 119 of their 162 games. Inside, they had an eight-man bullpen all year. <laughs> two and two. Tommy Helms on deck. Hit hard but foul in the upper deck down the left field line. Tommy Helms with that weighted donut on his back. Third strikeout for McNally. Here's Helms up, grounded out. You've heard a lot of talk about that background, those Tommy white houses. Tommy Helms. Uh, it's worse for uh, the batters with a right-hander on the mound than a left-hander. Right-hander coming over the top, the ball sort of comes out of those white houses. Ball one. I remember when I was broadcasting with the Red Sox. It's like Jim Merritt warming up. Ted Williams used to uh, talk about that back then. There's a fly ball, hit the left fielder, Don Buford. And that's it. Three up and three down. At the end of three and a half, Baltimore three, Cincinnati one. Tony Kubek. With me down to the Orioles dugout, the bat boy, Jay Mazzone. Jay, how long have you been the bat boy for the Orioles? Five years now. Five years. You're sure supplying the right bat for the last few days. Yeah, just keep it for another day or two. You think you can? That's you taking care of Robbie's bats? Yes, sir. You're an inspiration to my two boys, Jay. I hope they grow up like you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jay Mazzone. Back upstairs. That boy lost his hands, the little boy in a fire. And he has really done the job here for the Orioles. Shows what you can do with character and determination. Brooks Robinson doubled in two runs in the first inning. Hit down to Perez at third. One down. A lot of the batters are going for that first pitch today. Talking about Ted Williams, Chuck, you know, he wanted a perfect background everywhere. He wanted that ball as big as a watermelon coming in. They uh, planted those trees out there to shield the white houses. But those trees haven't grown too much in the last 10 years. No, and it is. It's something that could be improved, and I do believe in the future the Orioles intend to do something about it. Davey Johnson. Outside to him, a ball. Davey fly to center his first time. He has a lamp black under his eyes. The glare of the sun. Fast ball for a strike. Cloninger is soaking wet now. 
That shirt of his is really soaked. Two and one. I don't know whether the fans can see it as well on television as we can here. One out, nobody on. Baltimore leading three to one. Right. Two and two. We pause briefly for station identification. This is the NBC Television Network. Two and two pitch. Low three and two. Kurt Gowdy, Chuck Thompson, Tony Kubek. Hope you're enjoying it as Andy Etcheverin's on deck. Johnny Bench uses that hinge mitt, same as Randy Hundley with the Cubs. It's very soft and flexible, and you, by the hinge, you can just sort of double it over like it's on a hinge. See it? And he tries to catch one-handed with a mitt, so he won't get that throwing hand in the way and break his fingers. He'll stab the ball and bring the ball to him. There was a good example of it. Johnson's on first. Randy Hundley was really the first one-handed catcher in recent years in the National League with the Cubs. His father Andy taught him to catch that way. They stab the ball one-handed with a mitt and then bring the ball to the throwing hand to get rid of it. Instead of having both hands out there and take danger of being hit by foul balls. If you've ever seen an old catcher's hand, you know what can happen to him. Andy Etcheverin grounded out his first time. Baltimore leading three to one. Last to the fourth. High breaking pitch beat foul. Johnson back to first. back again strike two it's hard to find good catchers but suddenly we're getting some very talented young catchers in both leagues although occurred I've only seen uh, bench in well two games plus the few innings we've watched this afternoon it's obvious that he is everything that's been written about him. two strikes Johnson at first, one out. One and two. Talking about watching now with this catcher's mitt. See how he stabs the ball one-handed all the time. Keeps that and see how he's throwing hands out of the way. goes two and two to Andy Etcheberry. Look at the crop of sideburns there. Yeah, he's quite proud of those sideburns, and he's got eyebrows to match. Tony Cloninger will be serving a two-two pitch to Andy Etcheberry. Three and two. Dave McNally, the pitcher, is due up next. Runner on first, one out. We'll see if they start him or not. He 
is going. Right three, the throw. Double play. Tommy Helms puts the tag on him. Well, let's take a look at Dave Johnson running on the 3 2, the called strike to Echebarren for the second out. And here's the way the double play occurs as Helms takes the throw. And Johnson missed, uh, avoided the tag the first time, but couldn't get to the bag before the tag was made the second time. He lifted the leg and got over it. Major League Baseball set a new attendance record in 1970. 29 million fans paid to see regular season games. This figure did not include the championship series, constituted an increase of a million and a half fans over the 69 season. Dave Concepcion, single or right his first time. Plus the bunt, ball one to him. This is his third postseason on deck, you saw Cloninger. At the drive to left, Buford there for it. One down. Ball started to sink and then sailed. Took off. Twice. Concepcion's hit the ball on the nose. Cloninger took a call third strike his first time. Number 40, Johnny Cloninger. The Royals got two in the first. Double. Frank Robinson hit a homer in the third with two down, nobody on. The Reds scored in the second. Three to one. Baltimore. Pete Rose on deck. One out, nobody on. Strike two. Now he doesn't mess around in the mound. slowly McNally has it two down and Dave now has retired six in a row after Reds haven't had a hit off him since the second throws at the top of the order single to center lane to second David Johnson making a play of this game number 14 Dave Rose Downing ball to Belanger. One, two, three innings for McNally. We've gone halfway. Four and a half innings. The score, Baltimore three. The hand is up. And let's go down to Tony Kubek. With me, an old friend of Kurt Gowdy's and a smiling friend, the president. American League, Joe Conan and Joe, this Baltimore infield has got to be one of the best you've ever seen. Oh, I should say it. Third baseman's one of the greatest ever. The shortstop's a fine defensive player. Davey Johnson's over uh, his second baseman, and old Boog Powell, he catches him when he has to. Too. He's a pretty good hitter, too, isn't he, Tony? You're smiling again today. Yes, sir. It's a great ball game. Great series. Mr. Cronin, thank you so much. Back upstairs. Incidentally, Tony, it's Joe Cronin's birthday today, so Chuck Thompson, I'll and all the Now here's Chuck Thompson for the last part of the game. Thank you, Kurt. And that'll be a strike one to Dave McNally. That's too many happy returns to Mr. Joe Cronin. And the count now, two strikes. Kurt mentioned a day from the big sky country of Montana, and he did not play baseball in high school for the very simple reason that his high school didn't have a baseball team. His uh, baseball experience at that age. American Legion ball. But you listen to him tell tales of his basketball skill, Kurt. What a curve ball, and that'll be for McNally. He's been up there looking both times. Cloninger notches another strikeout, and that'll be number three. It's also one three, top of the ball in order. Don Buford. First inning, Buford walks. Third, and the Frank Robinson single. And he was among two who scored on the Brooks Robinson double in the first inning. Second inning, Cloninger handled Buford on a fly ball to right fielder Pete Rose. Wow. 
One strike now to Buford. Every time Buford steps in, uh, third baseman Perez will naturally shorten up at third base on the infield grass. He's a threat for them. One and one now. And there's a look at where they Buford. Other than that, they play him as a dead pull hitter, but he does have the bunning ability. One and one the count now to Buford. Well, that's hit very well. Let's watch Pete Rose, the right fielder. He hit a curveball right over the plate. A little bit inside to him. Buford, a leadoff man who on occasions can hit with power. He can generate a lot of power, can Don Buford, and has added the Orioles' fourth run of the ball game. Buford hit 17 home runs in the regular campaign and knocked in 66 as a leadoff hitter. Right fielder Rose calling for it, and that'll be the second out of the inning. Belanger, first ball hitting has been the The home run by Don Buford will be his second series home run. He hit one uh, first series at bat. And out on the Cincinnati bullpen, Wayne Ranger. Howell hitless this afternoon. Fouled out to the catcher. And the shift is again on with three infielders between first and second. Powell. They'll play him this way with, not a, with nobody on base. And May digs it out. The unassisted put out, the Orioles will run a base hit, and at the end of five complete, the score is Baltimore four, Cincinnati. All ready to go to the Cincinnati half of the sixth inning at Baltimore's Memorial Stadium, and it's Baltimore four to one over Cincinnati. Four runs, five hits, one error, Baltimore. One run, four hits, no errors. And here is Bobby Tolan, a perfect bunt single at the first, and ground out to second in the third inning. Consistency, uh, I think, is a trademark of this young man this year. He had 316 prior to the All-Star game and 316 after the All-Star game. All two. Kurt talked about uh, manager Earl Weaver being a great admirer of this fellow Tolans. Well, in the first game when Palmer pitched, Tolan doubled in the alley in right center. That was a perfect pitch. He could not have thrown it better, but yet Tolan handled it. Two and one now to Bob. Perez uh, is the on-deck hitter, and then it'll be Johnny Bench. Out of play. Two and two. Don Buford, left fielder. One gone. Eight in a row now, been retired by McNally since a walk to Tony Perez back in the third inning. Tony Perez. Perez hit into the double play in the first inning, and then the walk that we mentioned a moment ago. Maybe out of play. Looks like it is. Strike one to Perez. I guess there are more stories about Mr. Stengel than any other man in baseball. Foul ball. He was, he was a star in the World Series himself. I think the 1923 series. He had two home runs in that series and won two games for the Giants. Two strikes, the count to Perez with one out, and nobody on. Out of the sixth, four to one ball. Waste pitch, ball and two strikes. The unfortunate part is when you hear Mr. Stengel Casey talking about his, you know, prowess as a ball player, in the manner in which he presents it to you, you find it a little bit hard to believe, but the record book will substantiate it. One and two, the count to Perez. Two 
and two now. Earlier, Kurt Gowdy uh, drew a parallel between the Baltimore left-hander McNally and the former great Yankee left-hander Whitey Ford, and it is a very good parallel because they both work the same way. Four strikeouts for Dave McNally, and nine in a row now have been retired. By that I mean uh, McNally will pitch to spots. He has great control. He is able to get his kind of a pitch, for the most part, exactly where he wants it. And that uh, explains a good bit of his success. Here is Johnny Bench, lying to third baseman Brooks Robinson, fouled out to the first baseman, and a ball one. Yeah, Kurt. So far, Chuck, one thing he's done is shut out Perez, Bench, and May in the middle of that order. That takes some kind of doing. 2-0. Oh. I'm we were talking, uh, you know, as we're out for the commercial, and it, it would appear that the way the ball game is progressing in the series going, the Cincinnati Reds, they need some kind of a break, something unusual, or, or something to, to seem to get them started. This may be out of play. We'll watch Boo Powell. No, it's out of play. Well, last year, the Orioles needed the same thing against the Mets and didn't get it. Well, that's very true, and I, I'm convinced of the fact that there was not a team in baseball that could have beaten the New York Mets last year. They were just unbelievably good and richly deserved everything that happened to them. Two and one to count the bench, two out, nobody on. Well, McNally has tried that repeatedly this afternoon. He's not gotten too many strikes with the off-speed uh, pitches, but I believe that is part of the Baltimore scouting uh, book on uh, the likes of Perez, Bench, and May. If you can, give them a lot of, well, what do they call it? Slop, I guess. But just off-speed uh, pitches. They're very aggressive hitters. Would you believe that? Well, this, this guy's in another world. I mean, he's unbelievable. Watch this play by Brooks Robinson. He says he goes to his left better. You'd have to believe him, although he's made two great plays to his right. Look at that. The outstanding reflexes are what make a third baseman, and he has them. So at the middle of the sixth inning, the score is Baltimore 4, Cincinnati 1. Here it is again. Robinson poised and ready. Ball hit like a bullet to him. And those instant reflexes, he's not fast, but for a step or two, he's outstanding. Strike one to Frank Robinson. And this is Connie Robinson, uh, alongside of the uh, balding gentleman with the uh, large glasses. This is Connie Robinson. And now it's uh, one and one to Frank Robinson. I'm sure Kurt has mentioned it in the past, but looking back again to the Brooks Robinson play, he is a natural left-hander. Writes with his left hand, eats with the left hand, and that explains a little bit the dexterity with the glove hand. Two and one to Frank. Frank, uh, 0 for 9, coming into game number three, is 2 for 2 this afternoon. A single and a home run. Baltimore RBI power, two runs batted in by Brooks Robinson, a single by Frank, and a single by Buford. Three and one out of Frank Robinson. Activity again on the Cincinnati bullpen is Wayne Granger. Tough pitch for Cloninger to make to Frank. No, he didn't get it. And we're watching Tolan and the left fielder. Al McRae. It'll be total. One gone. Here is Wayne Granger, and this is about the third time that he's been up and throwing in the Cincinnati bullpen this afternoon. First time in the very first inning. Paul Blair. Paul Blair walked below the bases in the Baltimore first. He singled in the Oriole third. the man of the moment, particularly in this 1970 World Series, Brooks Robinson, the on-deck hitter. 
if it stays in play. We're watching Johnny Bench, but uh, it is out of play. One ball and one strike. Well, there are two schools of thought in that little gesture you saw Blair tossing the ma mask back to Johnny Bench. If we look at Sparky Anderson, and he has reason for concern. Some managers would rather their player never bother to pick up that mask for the opponent. Now the 1-1. One, one. Oh, good breaking ball from Cloninger. One and two. Sparky Anderson's comment on his starting pitcher today he said, well, one thing I can guarantee you, he's all man. And what a battler is Tony Cloninger. Look out. They said. So Blair with a two for two afternoon and five hits in the uh, series. And listen to the ovation for Brooks Robinson. Standing ovation for him. Top player of all time in Baltimore history. Having a World Series almost unbelievable. Standing ovation. And uh, the ovation continues. And uh, Sparky Anderson is to the mound and the base hit by Blair. Uh, may have taken uh, Cloninger out of the ball game. It appears that they will go to the bullpen right now, and here a hard-working, courageous performer, Tony Cloninger, will now lead. Cloninger has pitched five and a third innings this afternoon and gets a deserving hand from the Baltimore folks. The Orioles have nicked him for a total of six base hits. Well, there is a break in action here at Memorial Stadium in Baltimore. The score, Baltimore 4, Cincinnati 1. Now, a word from Major League Baseball. Baseball action films for your media. For a catalog of baseball films, including World Series of 1970, What Makes an All-Star, highlights of the American and National League seasons, and other exciting shows, write on your organization letterhead to Major League Baseball Film Division, 685th Avenue, New York, New York. And now down to Tony Kubek. Good me, one of the all-time great left-handers, Lefty Grove. And Lefty, you saw Pie Trainer play, and you've seen Brooks Robinson. Can you compare them? Well, Tony, I say there's no comparison between the two of them. They're both the same. You put them on a scale, they'll bounce without even. You saw one of the greatest plays of all time just a while ago. Right now, we're going to go back upstairs. Thank you, Lefty Grove. Yes, thank you. All right, here is Brooks Robinson against Wayne Granger, who won the year for Cincinnati, won six and lost five, had 35 saves. If it stays fair, and it does. Brooks will be, no, he's going to go for two. They gave it to him. The left fielder, Al McCrae, declined the opportunity to throw to second base, and Brooks was ready to stop. Then he saw the ball headed toward third and took the extra base. Blair at third base. And we have runners at second and third with one out. Brooks had breaked. He uh, figured he had no chance of getting into second base. Number 15, Dave Johnson. And here now is Dave Johnson, and you see the sign for the intentional pass, and we're checking to see whether they'll rule that a single for Brooks and whether he took second on the throw or whether they will give him a double. The intentional pass is issued now to Dave Johnson. Granger in relief of Tony Cloninger, and that's the ball for Wayne is from, born in Springfield, Massachusetts, and lives in Huntington, Massachusetts, and attended Springfield College. His sixth year of professional baseball. And there's Earl Weaver, and the Oriole manager. And no matter the situation in the ball game, he is never very relaxed in the dugout. And you had a quick glimpse of Sparky Anderson Kirk. Weaver is quite a cheerleader in that dugout, isn't he, Chuck? He really is. The batter is Etchebarron, 0 for 2. That was very close to hitting him. Ball one. That's the seasonal story on Etchebarron. 
Wayne Granger set a major league record in 69 with 90 appearances, all in relief, and that's a heck of a lot of work. Exploded right down the groove. Brooks Robinson is credited with a double, and that will be his second double of the afternoon. One ball, one strike to Etcher Baron, one out, base is loaded. One and two. In the Cincinnati bullpen right now is a flame-throwing left-hander, Don Gullett. Here he is right now. This young man can really throw hard. Now back to Granger in the one-two to Etcher Baron, base is loaded. Just what he wanted, he got the strikeout. Two out. A big, a very big strikeout for Wayne Granger and now a building hand for Baltimore's pitcher, Dave McNally. This is Dave's third appearance, and he has uh, looked at third strikes. And on the screen right now, you see the very attractive uh, Mrs. McNally. The hair band and the... Uh, the light colored sweater. Two out, bases loaded. Granger really firing. It looks as though that sidearm uh, fastball of his is a natural sinker. A very necessary pitch to a relief pitcher. 6 170 pounds of Wayne Granger. One strike pitch to. He is pumping, isn't he, Don? You just happen to look in. Uh, Baltimore batting bottom of the sixth. Bases loaded, two out, and Baltimore leading four to one. Granger came on, gave up a double to Brooks Robinson, an intentional walk to Johnson, struck out Etcherbaron, and now the two-strike pitch to McNally. Nope, he just missed. One and two. deck hitter Don Buford player third Brooks second Johnson first two out two two pitch to McNally that's it pretty good grand slam home run just has a World Series history made. We're going to the record books. Frank Robinson pats him on the back. But Dave McNally has become the first pitcher to ever hit a Grand Slam World Series home run. And it's now 8-1 to one Baltimore. And Granger ready to go to work on Buford. Take care of him without any trouble. That's the final out of the inning. But at the end of six complete here in Baltimore, the score is Baltimore 8, Cincinnati 1. That's the 12th World Series Grand Slammer, the first ever by a pitcher. And within a 10-day span now, 
The Orioles have had two grand slams by their pitcher. Mike Cuellar did a grand slammer in the playoffs against Minnesota. It appears uh, quite evident that the Orioles, seemingly at this moment in the series, can do nothing wrong. Here is Lee May to lead off on the top of the seventh inning against McNally, who has retired the last ten in a row. Foul ball. It's nagging the back of my mind, and I'm just trying to think. I think McNally has hit a grand slam before. Of course, we're talking now in World Series, but not in a World Series, but he has hit a grand slam before. One and one. to Lee May. Three and one. Three one to Lee May. Three and two. Bob Gibson is the only other pitcher to have hit two home runs in the World Series. Three, two. Ball four. And the string stops at ten in a row on this walk to Lee May. The last man to reach for the Reds was a walk to Tony Perez in the third inning, and now the leadoff walk to Lee May, starting the Cincinnati seven. Al McCray. He singled in the uh, second inning, struck out in the fourth inning. He has scored the lone Cincinnati run. They said Buford running it down. And uh, May will hold at second base as McCray chips in with his second hit of the afternoon and his fourth hit of the series. And now with the uh, runners at first and second and nobody out, the Reds are showing signs of coming back. Someone you know needs USO. The GIs and the armed forces come from every community, including yours. Serving with them are Red Cross and USO. How much they do is up to you. Support them with your fair share to your United Way campaign in your community. If you don't do it, it won't get done. And now here is Tommy Helms. Slow bouncer. That's one. And they cannot get two. The force executed on McCray at second base. Taking third May, reaching on the force play Helms, one out in the inning. Baltimore's bullpen alive with right-handed Eddie Watt Dave and Dave Concepcion, who has hit the ball sharply both times up, singled in the second inning sharply to right field, and fly to left field in the fifth inning. And along with uh, the right-handed Eddie Watt in the Baltimore bullpen, the southpaw Pete Ricker has begun to throw. Runners first and third, one out. Good breaking pitch from McNally. Your runner at first base, Tommy Helms. Just missed, one ball, one strike. Woody Woodward is in the on-deck circle you saw him just a moment ago. Watching Frank Robinson in right field, tagging the runner at third is Lee May, tagging at first base Helms, and Frank Robinson's throw will go to second base, and the second run comes in in the person of Lee May. Sacrifice fly for Concepcion, and a run batted in. Two gone. Your attention, please. And here is the announcer Number six. on uh, Woody Woodward. And he is 0 for 4 in the series. And hit 223 on the year. One home run and 14 runs batted in. 
Woody Woodward batting for Wayne Granger. Eight to two, Baltimore. Baltimore eight runs and eight hits. Cincinnati two runs on five. And the top of the order represented by the man you see, Pete Rose. delivers with his first hit of the 1970 World Series a loop single in the alley in left center that is just as good as the best line drive of the world and that keeps uh, Cincinnati moving with uh, Pete Rose singled his first time up and a brilliant diving catch by second baseman Johnson took a base hit away from him in the third and in the fifth inning Rose grounded to the shortstop this fellow looks so natural it's a uh, easy to forget now and then that he is in truth a switch hitter. Rank one to Rose. Helms, the runner at second base. And at first base, pinch hitter Woody Woodward. And this will be a one strike pitch to Rose. Said I had a nagging remembrance in my mind that McNally had hit a, a grand slam home run before. Well, he did. He hit it in 1968, August, against Chuck Dobson. So it's the second grand slam home run of his career. Base hit. Helms headed for third. And he is going to score without attracting a throw. And it's an 8-3 to three ball game as the Reds... Uh, play that battling aggressive style of baseball that brought them their National League championship. Credit Rose with a run batted in. It is eight to three. And you will see the Baltimore pitching coach George Bamberger. And uh, this man on your screen deserves a tremendous amount of credit for the job he has done with the Baltimore pitching staff. He uh, eliminated uh, quite a few sore arms and I guess overall, if you ask George's theory of coaching pitchers, it's just a lot of hard work. And they run a lot. They throw a lot. And that kind of activity has fortunately kept Baltimore free of sore arms. George's third year with the Orioles as pitching coach. Number 28. Bobby. Never Bobby. won a game in the major leagues, but yet one of the most successful pitching coaches in all of baseball is George Bamberger. Now here is Bobby Tolan. Two out, two runs in for the Reds. It's eight to three. Oh, good fastball from McAllen. He had it right where he needed it. Tolan uh, has reached on a bunt single this afternoon in the first, grounded to second and fly to left. may be troublesome. Belanger coming over. Seems to be getting to it. He's got it. That's the final out. Belanger's quick speed handled it. But the Reds have a good top of the seventh inning. And, the and let's go down to Tony Kubek. Thank you. With me down here, the wife of Dave McNally, Gene, and Dave's boy, Jeff. Mrs. McNally, uh, Dave's having a pretty good day. Great. Really exciting. You know, I don't know why you're so nervous, because Dave doesn't look like he's nervous at all. I think he is. I'm having a tough time settling down. I'm sure he is trying to pitch. I don't know how I can do it. Jeff, when your pops came up there with the bases loaded, what were you thinking about? I thought he wasn't going to get a hit, and I thought he was going to get out. You thought he was going to make it out? He's a pretty good hitter. Yeah. Gene, thank you so much, Jeff. Your boy's having a good day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mrs. McNally and Jeff. Upstairs. Thank you, Tony Kubek. What did the... Uh, Jeff say about his daddy? He said, I thought he was going to make out or, or get out or now something like that. Make an out. Make an out, yes, that's right. Well, we have now the flame-throwing young left-hander, Don Gullett. 
and I've seen the young man, but uh, in this World Series, and I thought he threw very, very hard in Cincinnati and was informed uh, that he threw even harder in the playoffs against the Pirates. National League batters will have him to face now for years to come. They all think he's going to be a real star. Oh, sure. a bat on. He's got a good delivery, Chuck. If the fans watch it, a smooth delivery, that means that he probably won't have any arm trouble. Well, you just sit back and watch this young fellow. He'll just bring that, uh, as Boog Powell would call it, serious heat. A uh, good fastball, strike one to Mark Belanger. This young man, and he is 19 years old. Born and lives in Lynn, Kentucky. Watch Helms. One gone. Helm started to the right on that ball, had to reverse and go back to the left. Here is Boog Powell, uh, hitless this afternoon. He came in uh, with a 500 batting average, the three hits and six trips uh, coming into game number three. Has fouled out, bounced out to the shortstop, and uh, went out unassisted to the first baseman, May. And, uh, there's a good story, 107 lifetime home runs in Baltimore. With nobody on, uh, again, the Reds will institute a three-man overshift. Uh, three infielders between first and second. A breaking ball from Gullet. Ball one. And you take a look at the way defensively Cincinnati is playing. The man with, at times, just awesome power. You ought to hear the, the crowd kind of stirring a little bit, Kurt. You hear that ball popping that catches mid all over the ballpark. Mm. Two and one now. And you are correct, Kurt. He does have a very fluid, very easy motion. He doesn't seem to force the pitch a little bit. Now the 2-1 to Powell. 3-1. and one. We can look at it in slow motion, Kurt, this fine delivery from Gullet. The big boys, over 200 pounds. Nice and easy. Good follow through. The body behind it. 3-1 to Boog. Ball four. So Gullet has given up his first walk. Granger in relief puts two-thirds of an inning for Tony Cloninger. Two base hits, a walk, a strikeout, and three runs. Here is Frank Robinson with a two-for-three afternoon, a single, a solo home run, and then a fly ball to the center fielder total. Lee May is not going to bother holding uh, with uh, Powell at uh, first base. One out. And this is a challenge for Frank Robinson. Get Frank at second base. Boog Powell takes third. Frank Robinson is credited with a bad hop single. And uh, the throw from the left fielder to the second baseman takes care of Frank Robinson for the second out of the inning. And Earl Weaver is on the scene with second base umpire Bill Williams. Uh, Frank came up beeping, uh, apparently, that the tag was missed, and Weaver is out there as much to protect his ball player as anything else, as you well know. That is one of the very few times you will see Frank Robinson thrown out, taking the extra base. Well, I like Joe DiMaggio, a great base runner, doesn't steal a lot of bases, but knows when to go first to third to go for the extra base. And give credit to Hal McCray, a former infielder who played that ball as an infielder. This is out of play, strike one. In other words, he made the barehanded pickup in the quick throw that got Frank in second. Powell third, two out now in the bottom of the seventh. Baltimore eight, Cincinnati three. Look out, it's out of play. Uh, excuse me, that look out was for myself. I thought it was coming in the booth. Brooks Robinson, the on-deck hitter. Foul ball. Who 
Booth looks like the gas house gang down there with all that dirt over his back. Ball in one, too. Two strike pitch to Blair. Out of play. Don Gullett is pitcher number three this afternoon for Cincinnati. It started with Cloninger, five and a third, six hits, three walks, three strikeouts, and five runs. Base hit. Powell will score, and he's in as Blair goes for two and reaches. Brooks Robinson, who is two for three this afternoon, and four for 11 in this series, which is quite a comeback, as Brooks's figures in the World Series a year ago were disappointing, to say the least. Watch uh, first baseman Lee May. That's the final out of the inning, but the Orioles pick off another run. And so at the end of the seventh inning, the score is now Baltimore 9 and Cincinnati 3. Number 24, Tony Perez. Here is Tony Perez to start the Reds in the top of the eighth inning. Ball one. Well, the Reds made up a little ground against Dave McNally in the top of the seventh inning with two runs on three hits. And the Orioles probably came back to the run of their own game 9 to 3. Ball two to Perez. Tony uh, hit into a double play in the first inning, walked in the third, and struck out in the sixth inning. Now well, Powell is calling for it. One gone. At one time in the game this afternoon, Dave McNally retired 10 Reds in order between a third inning walk to Perez and a seventh inning walk to Lee May. Here is Johnny Bench. He's 0 for 3 this afternoon and with a break could be 2 for 3. Strike one to John. First inning he hit a smoking line drive right at the third baseman Brooks Robinson. In the sixth inning a base hit and Brooks somehow or other made just one of those unbelievable catches. One and one now to pick bench. And behind bench, Lee May. Missed with a curve, two balls and a strike. Maybe out of play. Etcher Baron will give it a look. Two and two to Johnny Bench. Baron caught the foul tip and uh, did not hold apparently and uh, is shaken by the pitch and we'll have a little bit of a recess while Andy tries to walk off the sting of that foul tip. Chuck checking back the three games. The Reds were supposed to have the advantage in power. But the Orioles have now hit seven homers in this series to three for the Reds. As we said a little earlier it appears at the moment that no matter what the Orioles do, it is right. Uh, including the ball that Frank Robinson hit that uh, could have been turned into a play that took the bad hop over the head of the shortstop in the left field and gave the Orioles still another chance and they took advantage of it with still another run. Now the 2-2 pitch to Bench. You're out, Mr. Bench. A beautiful curve from uh, McNally. A bench apparently uh, felt it didn't have the play. Five strikeouts now for Dave McNally. Two out in the Cincinnati half of the eighth. And now Lee May. He struck out, grounded the third and walked, and has scored 
One of the Cincinnati runs. 34 home runs and 94 runs batted in. Base hit. I have to say he was ready. Eight hits now. We pause briefly for station identification. This Out single by Lee May brings in Hal McRae, and he's had two for three this afternoon, and a total of four hits for Cincinnati in the series to date. Into the Oriole dugout. This young man uh, originally was a uh, second baseman, but with the likes of Tommy Helms out there, the Reds uh, felt that. It might be better if uh, they could get his bat in the ball game at another position, and so he was converted to the outfield. That's the uh, lead of the runner at first, Lee May. Two out, one strike to Hal McCray. Dave Johnson, see if he has a play. Apparently, he's going to handle it all alone. That's it, uh, the third out on the top of the eighth. No runs, a base hit, no errors, the man left. Uh, so at the middle of the eighth inning, the score is now Baltimore 9 and Cincinnati 3. Tomorrow, game four of the World Series. Full coverage beginning at 12.30 Eastern Daylight Time. Three game show hosted by Joe Guerrero-Giola with Sandy Koufax and Mickey Mantle. We'll have NFL football on NBC Sunday. If the series would go to seven games, the odds are getting bigger every day that it won't but if it does we'll have a game following the world series on sunday pittsburgh and houston otherwise many fine attractions for you on nbc consult your listings for the game that'll be seen in your area and here's chuck again dave johnson leading off in the last half of the eighth inning and a ball one from gullet tomorrow well it'll be the two that started the 1970 series See whether Pete Rose will make the play or the second baseman Helms. It's going to be Rose, and Pete handles it flawlessly. One away. And, of course, it means Jim Palmer for Baltimore, Gary Nolan for the Reds, here at Memorial Stadium in Baltimore on NBC tomorrow. Number eight, Andy Echeverra. Well, Echeverra is 0 for 3. Grounded the third and uh, struck out twice. Concepcion. Two away. And a hand building, and uh, deservedly so, for Baltimore pitcher Dave McNally. McNally looked at a third strike in the second inning, looked at a third strike in the fifth inning, and then, of all things, hit the grand slam home run in the sixth, the first pitcher in World Series history to have done so. Two strikes to McNally. He could be there just to take three. In the Cincinnati ninth, Helms, Concepcion, and then we'll see how Sparky Anderson will go from there. Out of play in the foul ball. Checking the base hit leaders. Blair now has taken the lead in the series. He's had six hits. The leading base hit leader. One and two now to Dave McNally. Well, <laughs> that'll make for a lot of conversation in the Oriole clubhouse. And Paul Blair's nickname is Motor. And it refers not only to his speed of foot, but his words. Now watch the left fielder, Al McRae. And he's got it. Three up, three down. And at the end of eight innings, the score is Baltimore nine and Cincinnati three. 
Well, the Cincinnati Reds will come on against Baltimore left-hander Dave McNally. Top of the ninth inning, six runs down. Nine to three, Baltimore. Baltimore, nine uh, runs, ten hits, one uh, error. Uh, Cincinnati, three uh, runs, eight hits, no uh, errors. Tommy Helms and Dave Concepcion and the pitcher are the due batters. And here is Helms, who is 0 for 3 this afternoon. And he laid the fastball in. Baltimore bullpen will have left-handed Rickard and right-handed Watt going. Two strikes to Helms. McNally with three outs to get for the third win in this series. And there is a base hit for Tommy Helms. And that's his second hit of the series. Have you ever wondered what a manager says to his pitcher or perhaps how a catcher and a manager will try to teach a young pitcher the basic points of the game? Well, in tomorrow's World Series report with Joe Garagiola, Sandy Koufax, and Mickey Mantle, Joe will show us a great piece of film that was taken during an actual game sometime in the hectic last week of the season. Sparky Anderson, the Cincinnati manager, was wired for sound, and the resulting conversation between Anderson, Johnny Bench's catcher, and the young reliever, Don Gullett, is fascinating. Be sure to watch it tomorrow at 12.30 Eastern Time on NBC. Watch Frank Robinson. One, he's got it, but no play at first base. Concepcion lines out for the first out of the inning, and Ty Klein will be the pinch hitter. Ty Klein. He's been to the plate twice with a base hit. Concepcion's hit the ball hard today, Chuck, every time. Every time up. Number 17, Ty Klein. Watt and Rickard in the Oriole bullpen. One out in the top of the ninth. And here is Ty Klein to see if he can do something to spark the Reds in their desperate situation. Frank one. Well, the weather in Baltimore this afternoon turned out to be a beautiful October afternoon, and just everything has gone Baltimore's way today. Fair or foul, in play or out, it is out of play. One and two. Jim Palmer against Gary Nolan tomorrow. Another one in the same area. Let's see if it's out of play. It is. And some lucky fan has a souvenir baseball from the 70 series. now to the pinch hitter Ty Klein one out Tommy Helms the runner at first and this young man and his teammates sitting on a nine to three lead over the Reds and threatening the sweep nope it was trapped one and no chance for the double but Helms again the, the victim of circumstances there wasn't a thing he could do about it so the force is executed at second base, Johnson to Belanger for the second out of the inning. Well, certainly our heartfelt thanks here in the NBC booth to Huey McDermott and Alan Roth, without whose work uh, these shows just couldn't get on the air. Two out, and now Pete Rose. Two for four this afternoon. No, 
Well, the Redlegs, who have had great success against left-handed pitchers, have hit McNally nine base hits. This could do it. Belanger to Johnson. The ball game is over. Baltimore takes a three to nothing lead in games over the Cincinnati Reds in the 1970s.